Okay, so we've already talked about the rhetorical aspect of writing, and if we haven't, you can go and check out the video that gives the big overview introduction to the rhetorical aspect of writing. What I want to do now is something that I usually cover very quickly in my college classes, mostly because um, these two things are um, bread and butter, uh, and a lot of high school students have some recollection of them, so it's more of like a memory trigger. But just in case, they could give you a sense of comfort, or maybe you just haven't heard those particular rhetorical concepts yet, um, but they're, they're truly foundational to and a, a rhetorical uh, consideration of writing or just giving yourself a model of writing. And so we're going to talk about two of these things. Um, and so for rhetorical basics, we're going to talk about the rhetorical triangle and the tr three traditional Greek appeals. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I will say that even if you've been introduced to my eight aspects of writing, um, which I think takes um, what I'm about to show you and makes it more, uh, more detailed and more easy uh, Easier to di easier to approach writing systematically because of um, if that eight aspects is scary. You've seen some of the images around. People get overwhelmed just because it's so much information. Come back to these simple things. This model has is from the Greeks. It's old. It's uh, it's solid. It's tested. It has four key components um, that we're going to begin with. So the rhetorical or communication triangle. And there's some nuance in there that I'm not going to worry about right now. So if you're a calm person, don't get mad at me. I'm just covering basics. So, um, so the rhetorical triangle starts with a sender or a writer. So every piece of communication, every piece of writing has to have an, an origin. Um, you can't have a produced text with no writer. So uh, the first step is who wrote the thing? So this is meaningful whether you're analyzing something um, as a reader or whether you're producing something as a writer. And so it's not just that there's a writer, it's if it's, if it's a reader, who is that reader? If you're the writer, if you're the reader and it is either way if you're the writer or if you're trying to figure out who the writer is it's not just that they exist and they had um, they wrote something it's all the things that go into that what is the context they wrote in why did they write that's actually key rhetorically what is the writer's purpose here why did they take the time to put something um, down as a piece of communication? Why did they make the effort? What context are they writing in? What influences do they have on them? Um, all of those things affect the writer. Um, and so we want to be aware of who the writer is, why they wrote, um, where they're writing, who's influencing them, what was their motivation, and what was their purpose? Those are key questions with this simple model. Um, they obviously, if they wrote something, there's a message or a text. Um, so a message could be something spoken, could be, uh, could be a text that's produced in a variety of ways, um, could include images or actual alphabetic text. So it's a text is another, um, in the scholarship we describe text as any produced thing meant to communicate. So a text is a produced piece of communication. So that could be a podcast, that could be a video, that could be a meme, that could be an actual essay, that could be a novel, that could be a poem. Whatever it is, it's the text and there's a message to it. So we've got the thing produced and then we also have what was the message, the purpose, uh, what is the argument, what is the claim, what is the content, all of that gets embedded into this one thing. So we have sender, we have sender sending a message and if the sender is sending a message, it is um, logical that there would what? be a receiver on the other end. Um, and so anything that is written, anything that is communicated, is done so with a receiver or an audience in mind, uh, there, even if it's yourself. Um, and this is more obvious in things like, uh, you know, I don't know, a movie looks like Memento. Isn't that the one where he tattoos messages to himself on his arm to help him solve things and there's amnesia and all that? Um, but even if you're writing a note, notes in class, who's the audience? It's not usually your teacher, it's you. And it's not you today, it's you three days from now. It's you two weeks from now. It's you as you study a test. So you want to be, even if it seems like you're writing 
and no one else is on the other side. There's always this, any piece of communication has a sender, a message, and receiver, and that's what we get from the Greeks. And each of those are very loaded words that have a lot of depth to them, but we could also just simply say, here's a basic model of any piece of communication or writing. We have, some, we have someone who wants to send a message, to write a message, we have uh, a, the actual message that was sent, written, produced, and then we have who it was sent to. Um, the receiver, the audience, the reader, the viewer, how, whatever it is, um, that, however you want to describe that, sender message receiver is the traditional model for that. And all of that happens in a very specific context. So, if we haven't gotten to the eight aspects of writing yet, fine, that's cool, this is basics. This is going back to the Greeks, this is rhetorical practice, this is in every first chapter of every rhetorically based textbook on writing I've seen is the communication or the rhetorical triangle, sender, message, receiver, all within a context. Context is complex. Um, often we can get into sociocultural norms, we can get into common genres, preferred means of communication, technologies, and all that other stuff. Um, but I unpack those in more detail and I think in better um, categorization or systematicity or looking at writing as a holistic thing in the eight aspects model, which is meant to build on this or meant to be a, an alternate, deeper, more complex version of thinking about writing. But if that's too complex and it scares you and it overwhelms you, one, that's normal, and two, you can always come back to this sender message receiver context, uh, the simple rhetorical triangle, okay? Every piece of communication should have those. If it doesn't appear to have one of those, either it's not communication or somebody's missing something, okay? Uh, the last part, I'm not going to spend a lot on this, um, but there traditionally are three Greek appeals that we get from Aristotle. Appeal to ethos, appeal to pathos, appeal to logos. Most people remember the logos because it sounds like logic, reasoning, facts, statistics. Um, appeals to pathos, link to emotions. That's the traditional way of thinking about it. Um, but the, it also has this other texture that deals with felt needs and desires. And this is why when we, uh, it's not just Sarah McLaughlin and a puppy and, and the Lost Puppies commercial, which is it gets our uh, emotions, our empathy going and that sort of thing. But felt needs and desires means it also connects to key appetites we have, which is why Carl's Jr. adds that some of us might find immoral and lead us to boycott them, or not. Um, <laughs> uh, some, of, but you know, Carl's Jr. ads or whatever, where they've got a woman in a drive-through eating a burger and she's not wearing a whole lot and she's making funny noises. Um, that 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 is meant to appeal to felt needs or desires, and the combination of hunger and, in that case, sexual desire. Like those powers combined are considered appeals to pathos. And so we want to not just be aware of pathos as an emotional draw, but also as um, those things that some people would consider felt needs or desires and people who write in that way. There are whole genres dedicated, for better or worse, to um, this form of communication. And we want to be aware of it so that... Um, so that we can be more critical readers and more effective writers to know when and when not, it, when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate to use certain appeals. So appeals to logic, facts, statistics, appeals to pathos, I mean, I'm working in reverse order, bottom to top, sorry, and appeals to credibility. Um, appeals to ethos, people often get this uh, mixed up a little bit. They'll immediately go ethos, it looks like ethics, so that's it. It's not quite ethics and here's why. Um, in the Greek culture, they had to defend themselves, and they def the appeal to ethos is that is a person laying out, um, because they didn't have they didn't exactly have lawyers for a while. Is the person laying out why they are someone you can trust when they give you information, and so someone who is ethical is a credible witness or a credible person giving a credible testimony. So ethos has a, there's a, a one-off link to ethics because someone who is ethical is, is trustworthy or credible. Um, but they also have to take time to prove that. It's like, look at my everyday life. Look at how I treat my kids. Look at how I treat my wife. Look at how I work on the job. Look at how I um, do all these other things. And you will see that I am an ethical, credible person, that I try and do these things a certain way. And um, I try and be without reproach or without... Um, someone who you can't uh, 
who you can't attack for character flaws. Um, and so that would be an appeal to ethos. Because I'm ethical, I am a credible witness. Um, those things, I've added a little nuance to them, um, but those three things are the three traditional Greek appeals. Sometimes they get pushed up into the whole rhetorical triangle thing. I don't really like the layout of that, and I don't, uh, I don't really find it meaningful. I like pulling these apart and using them as two separate systems or two, um, two sister systems uh, to do analysis or to think through what I'm doing. So with that, um, those, that's rhetorical basics, like foundation, like first day, chapter one. Um, and I do explode um, in my writing content into a much more complex, holistic, systematic model um, that goes beyond sender, message, receiver. But this is also a really happy place. This is, can be your home. And it, when things are overwhelming or if you're trying to just do something quick, don't forget to consider your audience. Don't forget to consider yourself as a writer. Are there emotions playing on you right now? Um, have you checked your logic? In this instance, are you writing a message based from a position of credibility? And what is the context you're writing in? Um, and there, are, I've got some other videos that pull some of these pieces apart in much more depth. So have fun and hopefully you found this meaningful.